Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. And I think sometimes we're like, well, God's done great things, and we've watched it, and we've seen it, and then we're just like fearful for whatever reason, faint-hearted. And if that's you, and I know it describes some of you, it's your, your, your natural response to, to fear and, and to those who would make you fear. In any case, he's just saying, cheer up. Don't be afraid. In today's study, we have a new two-part study from Pastor Sam entitled, Paul, the Sanhedrin and the Centurion. Acts chapter 23 is where we are, and this study covers that chapter in its entirety. Paul is in custody, but this custody is unlike his imprisonments in the past. He is protected against the ongoing efforts of the Jews to kill him. So, let's listen in. One of the things you can't help but become aware of as you walk through a book like the book of Acts is that God is always working behind the scenes. He paves the way before we walk the path that he's planned for us. We see this in the, the big picture. At the time that Jesus came and walked upon the earth, they, well, Greek was the language of the day. They spoke it pretty much everywhere. Of course, the scriptures were written, written in Hebrew. The, the, the people of God spoke Hebrew and Aramaic, but they also knew Greek 200 years before Jesus. They translated the entire Old Testament into Greek. And, and so God had given sort of a universal language, much as English is in the world today. He'd also used the Romans. They built the roads that made travel from one place to another far less dangerous than going by ship and and so the gospel was able to get out. There was a common language. There were good roads, at least for the day. And then he takes people like the Apostle Paul, adamantly opposed to Jesus and to the idea that he was the Christ, meets him on the Damascus Road, turns him completely, transforms him from a persecutor to a preacher and promoter and church planter, a pastor teacher. He's still doing that kind of thing today. Well, Paul's desire, and we looked at this last time, was to share with his brethren the Jews. He was absolutely convinced, even though God told him, hey, they're not going to listen to you. He was convinced that because they knew him, because they knew he was sincere, because they knew he was a scholar, because they knew him, that they would, in fact, listen to him. He finally gets his opportunity. He's there just sharing personally and privately, and then... Some problems arise, and is often the case for the Apostle Paul. He finds himself arrested. The Romans are taking him up this great staircase, and he, he says, hey, is it all right if I speak to these guys for a moment? And he's given the opportunity. He begins to share in the Hebrew language. Now, that silences the crowd, and they've been hostile toward Paul up to this point. And, and so they're listening, and when he gets to the word Gentiles, they go berserk. They start shit, ripping their clothes. They start throwing dust in the earth, in the air, saying, "Hey, this man is unfit to live," you know. And and so, well, the commander, wanting to know what's up, since he doesn't speak Hebrew, he just sees the crowd again going berserk. And the first, the reason he came in the first place was to rescue Paul and to end a potential riot. Well, he says, hey, you know, take him in and scourge him. Find out what in the world's going on. And Paul says, hey, is it legal to scourge a Roman citizen who's uncondemned? See, like our system of justice, you were considered innocent until you were proven guilty. And because Paul was a Roman citizen, he survived not only the arrest and the imprisonment, but he was able to keep himself from this particular time of scourging or beating. Well, in any case, now he stands before the Sanhedrin. He had once been a member of this political spiritual body. These were the religious leaders of Israel. They're made up of Sadducees and Pharisees. We'll see that. We'll see the difference. It's spelled out for us. But he stands before them and no doubt recognizes some of them. He remembers this is the same group that condemned Jesus to die. This is the same group that voted for Stephen to be put to death, Paul being among them at that time. 
He doesn't recognize the high priest. We'll see that. So Annas is gone. Caiaphas is gone. A new guy, Ananias, is ruling. He is the chief legal and spiritual moral authority in Israel. And that's where we pick up. Paul looks earnestly at the council, chapter 23, verse 1, said, Men and brethren, I've lived in all good conscience before God until this day. The high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God will strike you, you whitewashed wall. Not exactly, Father, forgive him. He knows not what he does. No, Paul was a passionate person, and, and all he's doing is he's responding to the injustice of being smitten, though he hadn't been convicted of anything. He's expecting these guys to do the right thing, and one of the ironies of this time in history is though the Jews hated the Romans, the Romans were actually living in accordance with their law. The Jews were out of control, as we'll see in the passage. So anyway, Ananias commands him to be struck. Paul rebukes Ananias and says, you're going to get yours, dude. And then he says, you sit to judge me according to the law? And do you command me to be struck contrary to the law? Those who stood by said, do you revile God's high priest? Paul said, I did not know, brethren, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, there's no punctuation in the original, so we can't know how Paul actually said this. It's possible that he said, I didn't know he was the high priest. Why? Probably wasn't decked out in his garb that would set him apart. Paul didn't recognize him, obviously. But... The point is, he goes from demonstrating his passion, his aggression, his intensity, which many of us can relate to, to, to showing some prudence. He realizes, okay, well, if he's the high priest, I shouldn't have spoke evil of him. He's actually apologizing for that. And then he quotes the scripture, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, because we want to make sure we have something to take home and apply, we're not just trying to gather information. We're trying to be transformed by that information. And well, here's a principle. We're not to speak evil of our rulers. If you can't find something to appreciate about the man, you still have to appreciate the office that he holds. And this is certainly true in politics. And realize these guys were both a religious and a political body. They were functioning as both. And so I look at the political scene and, and I have to admit, I, I need prayer when I look at those guys and think about them. I mean, I want to pray for them, but like David does, break their teeth in their mouth, Lord. And it's imprecatory prayer. It's an unbiblical mindset. But I know Jesus wants me to pray, God, transform them, change them. And if he changed Paul, could he change anyone? Absolutely. And so we're instructed to pray for those who are in authority over us. Pray for the rulers that, that there would be peace in our midst. And that's never more necessary than now. And in this day, in this age where so many things are just not what they should be. Well, we see his passion in his rebuke. We see his prudence in his apology. And, and then we see his wisdom here in verse 6. When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, men and brethren, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Concerning the hope and resurrection of the dead, I am being judged. When Paul later writes, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. He tells us how it's meant to profit us. And he says, for doctrine, it tells us what's true, what's right. And here's the doctrine of the resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection of the just and the unjust. That all of us will face the Lord after the resurrection. We will either stand where our works are tried and judged and we're rewarded. Or we'll stand and, and hear those words, depart from me. And you want to make sure that you're ready to, to be a part of that first group. No unbelievers in the first resurrection. No believers in the second. And so you want to be a part of the first. Well, in any case, he says, I'm a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. I'm being judged because I believe in and preach the resurrection. 
And then when he said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection, no angel, no spirit. That's why they are Exactly. That's why they're sad, you see. It's how we remember the difference. And if you're newer to us, now you see how many people know. It's important. These guys were the materialist of their day. If they couldn't see it, they didn't believe in it. If they couldn't touch it, they wouldn't embrace it. So, so they're saying, we don't believe in the resurrection. We don't believe in these angels. We don't believe in these spirits. No, it's all about the now, the physical, the material, the temporal. Many people like that today. And then the Pharisees, they're the other group. That was the group that Paul came from. And, and, and well, they're very conservative. They don't just believe some of the word. They believe all of the word. They don't just study parts and pick and choose. They believe it all. They had their problems too, though. They were doing the right things, but Jesus says of them, their hearts were far from them. They were going through the motions. It's not that they were all playing a part. They thought what they were doing was enough to please the Lord. But the law that was meant to convict them and us of sin, well, they were thinking, well, I'm keeping it. That's why Jesus had to redefine it or clarify it. He says, you've heard it has been said you're not to murder, but I say you can't even hate or say you fool without being in danger of the judgment. You've heard it has been said you're, you're, you're not to commit adultery, but I say if you look on a woman to lust after her in your heart, you've committed adultery in your heart. Is he saying they're exactly the same? No. Because murder has to be more serious than harboring hatred that you never act on then uh, adultery has to be more devastating to the family and to you and to the community than, than, than having lust in your heart that you never act on. But what Jesus is saying, just because you never committed the act, doesn't mean you're off the hook. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God looks on the heart. So if the sin's in the heart and we're entertaining it and embracing it but never act on it, we're still guilty sinners in the sight of God. Why is he saying that? He wants everyone there to know. They're guilty that there are none who are righteous. No, not one. Well, in any case, as he starts to say, hey, I'm one of you, Pharisees. These guys, you know, they're persecuting me because of the, the, the fact that I believe in and preach and teach the resurrection. These guys are divided. The Sadducees say no resurrection, no angel or spirit. But the Pharisees confess both. There was a loud outcry. We read verse 9. The scribes of the Pharisees party arose and protested saying we find no evil in this man hey that reminds me of when Jesus stood on trial not before his people because they condemned him but before the Romans as Pilate said he's innocent I find no evil in this man nevertheless he sent him to his death they go on to say if a spirit or an angel is spoken to him let us not fight against God now this is wise counsel in other words since we can't always tell what's up what's happening we don't want to put ourselves in a place where we're opposing God back in Acts 5 Gamaliel the actual teacher of Paul the one who mentored him discipled him really says the same thing as the us, the, those first apostles had been arrested and threatened and warned, but they just continued to preach Jesus. And so they, they put him out, and, and they're, they're ready to deal with them harshly. And Gamaliel says, listen, think back. There have been others who rose up and a great following, you know, followed after them, and then they died, and the whole thing dissipated and turned into nothing. And then someone else rises up in the same thing. He says, if this is of man, it will come to nothing. But if it's of God, we don't want to find ourselves fighting against God. It's why, while I don't jump on board with everything that Christians are doing, you know, like this is happening and that's happening, hey, let's all go do that. I, I'm kind of slow to, to catch on or to jump on, and, and uh, God's blessed me that way. And, and, uh, and so the, the bottom line is, while I might not get right behind it, I also don't try to oppose it. Why? If it's not the Lord, it's going to go away. And in my short 30-something years of serving the Lord, I've seen a lot of things come and go. And some of them came and went and came back and went, and they're coming back again. But because I've seen what happens, I know they'll go again. So I don't spend all my time 
looking at what's not right. There's a place for that. There's a time for that. But we're looking for what is right. If we know what's true, we know what isn't true. And so, in any case, he just says, hey, we don't want to fight against God. We don't want to find ourselves fighting among ourselves. In fact, Jesus says at one point, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight. Now, I know in the context he's saying against you guys because he's talking to Pilate. But, but the issue is this. His kingdom is not of this world. And we're not to be fighting, not among ourselves, not with the world. We're his representatives at a time where people need to see the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. Well, at this point, they're saying we find no evil. If an angel spoke to him, you know, we don't want to fight against God. That's wise counsel. Now, when there arose a great dissension, the commander, fearing lest Paul be pulled to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them and bring him into the barracks. Once again, Paul rescued by the Romans. And here's an irony. The Sanhedrin, they're supposed to be the good guys. The Romans are supposed to be the bad guys. But it's the Sanhedrin opposing the gospel and Paul who's preaching it. And it's the Romans protecting Paul so he can continue to preach it. And it just reminds me to be careful about even judging the secular society around us. God is at work in ways we can't understand. Now, when there's something clearly morally or ethically wrong, well, we want to expose that, he says to. But we're not mainly here to battle against flesh and blood. There's a spiritual war, he tells us, Paul tells us, going on. We're wrestling against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places, not our brothers and, and not those who've yet to come to Christ. It's the system and the philosophy that opposes Jesus substitutes something for him that we're to be at war with. Well, again, they go down, they bring him in, they take him by force, they bring him into the barracks. Now, the following night, the Lord stood by him, verse 11, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must bear witness at Rome. We see this again and again. Jesus confronts Paul on the Damascus Road. He shows up in person. The result, Paul, is converted. Jesus shows up to comfort and encourage Paul in Corinth. Why? Because Paul's afraid and he says, don't fear, I have many people in this city. He means those people who were going to come to Christ as Paul would stay there and preach the gospel. And now he shows up and he encourages them to be of good cheer. Now, here's one of the things I've learned as I've studied through the scripture and walked with the Lord. He never warns us unnecessarily. If he says, don't be afraid, it's because he knows fear is our natural response to certain situations. And if he says, be of good cheer or cheer up, it's because he knows we get down that we get sad, that we, we worry and we fret. And he's just telling Paul, cheer up. Remember I told you, you're going to go and you're going to share in Rome. Well, I'm just reminded Jesus is for us. He's for us when we're confused or rebelling or even resisting him as he was with Saul. And he is the one who can bring Anyone, even the hardest, harshest person to Christ. When I was a very young Christian, Greg Laurie, preaching at my home church, Calvary Costa Mesa. So when you throw a rock in a pack of dogs, the one that barks loudest is the one you hit. It stuck with me. It makes sense to me. Yeah, what it's saying is when you share the gospel, the person who's sort of apathetic and like, whatever, they're really the person in the greatest danger, but the person who gets in your face and is adamant and pointing the finger and has all this, you know, animosity, that's the person that God's wrestling with. He's the one that the gospel is penetrating. And so, so you need to see it from that perspective. I'm more concerned. I worry more about the apathetic than the angry, aggressive person because I can see something's happening with that person. And that was Paul. So, if you're living with or dealing with a, a parent or a spouse or a son or daughter or family member and they're just aggressively, angrily against Jesus, just pray for them. 
If you've shared with them, just be a living witness to them. Just wait and watch and let God do his work. If he can turn Paul, he can turn anybody. He can turn anybody. Well, not only when we're confused or rebelling or resisting, but when we're discouraged and uncertain. Many of you are aware of Elijah's story. He faces off with the 450 prophets of Baal. Here is a guy who is fearless. 450 guys, no problem. Then he hears Jezebel's after him and he's like, I got to get out of here. He's scared to death of her. And he runs and he hides and, he, and he's in a cave and God shows up and says, hey, what are you doing here? And he begins to tell him, oh, they've killed all your prophets and, and this has happened and that's happened and I'm the only one left. So God gives him some time and gives him some signs. And then he says, hey, you, what are you doing here? And he's like, same exact story, word for word. And I think sometimes we're like, well, God's done great things and we've watched it and we've seen it. And then we're just like fearful for whatever reason, faint hearted. And if that's you, and I know it describes some of you, it's your, your, your natural response to, to fear and, and to those who would make you fear. In any case, he's just saying, cheer up, don't be afraid, be of good comfort. Well, when it was day, and this next part, is it's got to be my favorite. Some of the Jews banded together, bound themselves under an oath, saying they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who formed this conspiracy, and they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we've bound ourselves under a great oath that we will eat nothing until we've killed Paul. Now, therefore, together with the council, suggest to the commander he be brought down to you tomorrow as though you were going to make further inquiries concerning him, but we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Take note, this is one of those... Well, you know, there's, there's some scripture that's good for doctrine. It tells us what's right. And then there's some that's good for reproof. It tells us what's not right. And, and here's something that's just not right. They make a very foolish oath. And then they add to their foolishness by boasting about it. So let me encourage you. Don't make foolish oaths. In fact, Jesus gives some very good instruction in this area. He says, don't swear by heaven. It's God's throne nor by the earth, it's his footstool. Just let your yes be yes and your no be no. In other words, be a man of your word, a woman of your word. Don't be swearing you're going to do this and swearing you're going to do that. I believe this applies to New Year's resolutions. At least in my personal experience, they're easier to make than to keep. And don't you feel horrible two weeks in or four weeks in or the very you know strong among you two months in? And you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot I was going to always do that. Don't say I'm going to always or I'm going to never because inevitably you're just setting yourself up for a fall. Jesus says don't even make oaths. Now listen, oaths were never required, but if they were made, they had to be kept. And while we're not under the law, I would think that principle applies. If you promise God something, then he expects you to make good on the promise. Why? He wants you to be a man or woman of your word. So better not to make the promise unless you can keep it. Now, if you've surrendered your life to him, you've called him Lord. In a sense, you've made a promise. I'm going to live as if you were Lord. Save me, Lord, and, and I'll serve you. We need to make good on our part of that agreement. As we see these Jews making these ridiculous vows, these vows to kill Paul, we can ask, how on earth can those people reconcile their violent hatred towards another man and their desire to do something in killing him that God has expressly forbid them from doing? Now, I can't pretend to understand their mind behind this, but I do want to string a couple of verses together that might shed some light on this type of behavior for you and I. In John 15, 18, we know that Jesus warned us about this. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, then the world would love you. Yet because you're not of the world and that I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So why does the world have so much hate for Jesus? Well, in Romans 5.33, Paul reminds us that Jesus is a stumbling block and a rock of offense to them. Why? John 3.19 tells us why. It says, this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
for everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not want to come into the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace.